I was originally invited to come and talk about signs of life on the moon, which would have been far too short a talk. So I suggested this title instead. Very appropriate. I've been thinking about moons since I remember it very clearly when the last when Voyager had its last flyby of Neptune in 1989. I thought, let's write a book about this. So I did. And then we had the chance to produce a moon's mook last year, which was a lot of fun. Anybody here do the moon's mook? It's running again in February. It's, 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 um, OK, so search for life on moons. You might not think of moons as being particularly habitable places. I mean, our moon isn't a good place for life, which is why I changed my title. But what does it take? What do you need for a, a, a planetary body to be habitable, to, to be suitable for life? I mean, do you think you need an atmosphere? Do you need to have oxygen? Do you need liquid water? Do you need sunlight? Do you need a source of energy? Uh, which of those do you think are essential requirements for life? Well, here's what I think. You don't need an atmosphere. Uh, you don't need organisms breathing oxygen. We do, as far as we know, need liquid water. It's a wonderful solvent. All cells depend on water and so on. So you need temperature where liquid water is going to be available. Sunlight. You know, plants depend on sunlight. No plants, we'd starve. Well, fine, but there are ecosystems on the Earth which don't need sunlight. You do need an energy source, some kind of chemical gradient that life can grab hold of and use for its metabolism. That's all you need. You need water and an energy source, fundamentally, for life. And we do have water, and we do have energy sources inside certain moons, which is why moons are good candidates for life. And here's an environment on Earth. Um, it's the floor of the deep ocean. This column here being built up by chemicals precipitating is a metre or so long, and this is the plume of turbid water with precipitates forming in it. These are black smokers on the deep ocean floors. And there are, there's white scum around there, which is bacteria. There are a few shrimp and crabs and things scavenging around, feeding on the bacteria. There's a whole ecosystem down there that's independent of sunlight. And um, this is a favoured environment for where life on Earth could have first began. Ian showed a picture of kind of volcanic springs at the solid atmosphere interface, but put an ocean in between, you're protected from horrible ultraviolet sunlight or other kinds of harmful radiation, and you can start forming life even when the Earth is still being bombarded by quite a lot of meteorites if you're down at the bottom of the ocean. And if you look at the phylogenetics of life on Earth, the last common ancestor we can find is an organism that lives in hot um, environments like this and doesn't breathe oxygen either. So this is a good setting for life to begin on the Earth. And we've got settings like that, we think, inside various icy bodies. So if life could begin on the Earth, it could begin inside these icy bodies. So these are called, there's chemical energy there at the interface, and these things are called hydrothermal vents. Mars today, bone dry, with a few trickles of water coming out now and then, but the surface is certainly pretty hostile for life. It's bathed in UV radiation. There might be things underground if you dig for them, but you're not, it's worth looking for life on Mars, don't get me wrong. Uh, but if we want to find a complex ecosystem, we're far more likely to find one inside an icy moon, I would argue, than inside Mars. Icy moons have internal oceans. Um, here's a cross-section for Ganymede. This in the middle is meant to be its iron core. There's the rock. And everything above where I've got my cursor is water. Some of it is solid water, that's ice. Some of it is liquid water. Now inside a body with as much gravity as Ganymede, the ice can take various phases of different densities. And on this model, which only came out a year or so ago, there are, there are oceans at four different depths. So in any of those, you could have life, especially the lowest one, where the ice is sitting on top of the rock, is more chemical rich. So that, you could have life inside a body like, like Ganymede here. Now, that deepest ocean will be very hard to get down to. Um, so there are other moons which, are much, which have much more potentially accessible life. But just for scale, it's bigger than our moon, slightly smaller than the planet Mercury. This is a big body. Thank you. So here's Europa, which is about the size of our moon. We know from its density, it's probably got an iron core, yeah. then rock, then 100 or so kilometres of, of water. We don't know how much is solid, that's to say ice, and how much of it is liquid, but we're sure that some of it, most of it, is liquid water, the way it interferes, interacts with Jupiter's magnetic field, for example, and we can see clues on the surface that the ice has broken apart. So down here on the interface, 100 kilometres below the surface, 
um, we could have hydrothermal vents. We can also get the surface uh, like this. Why not hydrothermal vents like this on the floor of Europa's ocean? We know it's hot inside, it's tidally heated. We could have hydrothermal vents there supporting an ecosystem that doesn't need sunlight, doesn't care whether there's an oxygen atmosphere above the icy surface. I mean, there isn't. You don't need it. You can breathe methane or whatever. You just you can metabolise without the use of oxygen. So as well as the hydrothermal vents, if life began there, it could find its way to the surface in cracks. The surface ice breaks apart now and then, and life could have evolved into photosynthetic life forms inhabiting these cracks. So you've got an ecosystem potential on the floor of the ocean and in these ephemerally open cracks. So there could be life in cracks. So here's a view of Europa's surface seen from above. It's 100 kilometres across, and this is a crack which is opened and closed, and every time it closes, it squeezes some slush out and builds up a ridge either side. Go to one of those cracks when it's open, you could find the life in the ocean. Go to a crack when it's squeezed shut and scrabble around in the slush that's refrozen, you could find entombed dead organisms. So you know, here's what could be inside one of these cracks. Some plants clinging to the walls, some planktonic things which get sucked up when the crack opens and pushed back down when the crack closes, things which crawl. So you could have photosynthetic life near the surface as well as chemosynthetic life at the vents deep down. And we can tell that the ocean uh, is dynamic because look, look at an area like this. You can see places where you've got rafts of ice which have just barely broken apart. But over here, the, the, the ice has been completely disrupted and has refrozen in between. That ocean is occasionally exposed to space, we think. OK, so Europa is a, a big one. If you want to get down to the surface of Europa to look for life, it's quite a challenge, but I'll come to a possible solution at the end. But Enceladus, a satellite of Saturn, nearly 500 kilometres in diameter, is a much easier target to go for because can you see these plumes here? Below the South Pole, water is being jetted to space. Not as liquid droplets, it freezes straight away. I mean, the surface temperatures here are minus 160 centigrade, so it's way too cold at the surface for life, but once you can get warm water up there, you're OK. So we could have, there's an ocean clearly inside Enceladus, which is venting to space. All you then have to do is fly a spacecraft through that plume and sample it. And now here's a wonderful close-up of these, uh, these vents jetting a couple of hundred kilometres into space from these cracks near Europa, so near Enceladus's south pole. Fly through the right instruments, you can find life. Because it, if there's life inside, you should find it being jetted into space. Well, there's a the mission there called Cassini, which has flown through the plumes, but it wasn't equipped to look for life. Nobody suspected this when Cassini was designed. So that's a kind of model through Enceladus, so a, a, a rocky core, an ocean which may not be global, just a sea over the South Pole and tidal heat, disturbing things, keeping the water warm enough and venting to space. Um, so just to look ahead to where we, we hope to go in the future, um, Nearly two years ago now, ESA announced an instrument suite for its Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, a mission called JUICE, which we hope to have open university involvement in. It will orbit Jupiter. It will study Ganymede in detail. It will have a few flybys, through, uh, uh, flybys of Europa as well, looking for life on Europa. And this was going to be my last slide until last night when this news item came to my attention. This is a NASA proposal that's just received... $100,000 as a preliminary study to develop this concept further. It's a CubeSat. It's three things as big as a packing case, three or four things as packing case size bolted together, which it would go to Jupiter, map, uh, go to Jupiter, orbit Europa, map its gravity field, and then open up and just shower these things down onto Europa's surface. These are called chipsats because they're, they're pretty small things. Um, give you an idea of scale, they are not, they're smaller than this wonderful book, Planets of Very Short Introduction, $7.99 from Amazon, which I wrote, <laughs> but probably smaller than my iPhone, what they are like in size is the thickness of just a few individual Moon Trumps cards, which you can get from the OU website. And these things will be equipped with sensors just to do one or two specific tasks. You could kit these out to sniff out molecules to do with life, land them, ideally some would land beside some of these recently closed cracks and look for or the signs of organic processes having gone on on Europa. And Europa's hard to land on because you can't, it's got no atmosphere, you can't parachute down. 
share a few of these things down there, robust. Some will survive landing on the surface. Maybe that's the way of the future. I'll shower a load of chipsats onto something like Europa to see if there's life. Um, I'll have retired by the time that happens, but hopefully some of you won't have. And I think let's go looking for this life out there because I want to know, did life, if life began on the Earth, did it begin anywhere else? If we can find that life began independently of the Earth on one other place in the solar system, then, hey, all these exoplanets out there that Carol's going to talk about, surely life has begun on suitable exoplanets as well. But at the moment, all we've got to go on is one genesis on the Earth. If we can find a second genesis inside Enceladus, inside Europa, that's a fundamental change in our philosophy. Thank you. Sure. Any questions? And please wait for the microphone. Is there any problem with um, like bacteria from our um, world, you know, being put onto a pristine environment? Very much so. Um, it's very hard to get a lander on Mars clean, a lander on Europa clean. If you fill one of these things with chipsats, look at all the surface area on all of these little things. You've got to have them completely... We can't have them completely devoid of life. As devoid of life as you can before you launch. And you've got to hope that most of the things die on, on route. But some will survive. We know microbes can survive in space. There are rules in place by an organisation called COSPAR, Committee for... It's peaceful use of outer space. I forget what the acronym stands for. And there are rules which say anywhere you send a spacecraft from Earth, there must be less than a one in a thousand chance or one in a hundred chance of contaminating it. Because it recognises that ultimately, if we send something to another planet, we're going to contaminate it. Now, you may have ethical reservations about putting Earth microbes in an environment where they might live. It will certainly be harder to, harder to study the European um, biosphere if we've taken earthly organisms there as well. But it, ultimately, if we're going to explore space, we, we cannot avoid contaminating these other bodies. But on the other hand, nature might have done it already. We've got, as you heard in Ian's talk, we've got meteorites on the Earth which have come from Mars. There'll be bits of Earth rock which have been knocked off the Earth and found their way to Mars. So Earth and Mars have been exchanging bodily fluids for the past four and a half billion years. So life on Mars could have come from Earth or vice versa. It's harder to get from Earth to Europa. So it's likely that life on Europa is independent of the Earth, but we need to check that it hasn't got there accidentally. And we certainly don't want to deliberately, well, not deliberately, but accidentally contaminate Europa by sending a dirty spacecraft there. There's a question here, if we have time. Um, you mentioned water on a source of energy. Yeah. And saying, well, that's the prerequisite for life but we're carbon-based life forms. Is there any chance that there's another element that life is based upon? You say that you know, when we've gone there, we weren't looking for something. Is there a danger that we're not looking in the right place? Um, th there is a risk. You're, you're quite right. Uh, but I think we have to deal with, with, with life as we know it because we know life based on carbon and using water can exist. You can construct life based on silicon, but it doesn't bond to as many elements or germanium as carbon does. You can look for solvents other than water, but they don't seem to be as good. So let's begin, at least, by searching for things that we can recognise as life. But I, I, I don't have a closed mind. There could be other kinds of life. But people have looked at how life might work, can't come up with anything better than complex carbon-based molecules, and anything better as a solvent than H2O. So we're probably looking in the right places, but possibly not the only places. Okay. Thanks very much. Oh, two minutes, apparently. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, one more. One more. OK. <clears throat> A little bit off the wall. Why would you not accept that uh, we have already landed on Mars? Why would I not accept that what hasn't already landed on Mars? Life well, from Earth? Yeah. It could yeah. have, could have, it could have, we could have terrestrial life on Mars carried there on our spacecraft, which weren't clean enough, or carried on meteorites from Earth to Mars. 
No, I'm talking about human life that have been sent up from this planet up onto the Mars, uh, where there's underground cities. And this is all done by USA and NASA. There are, we have actually been on Mars since well before the Second World War. I um, really don't think there was the technological capability to do that, or that any conspiracy like that could have been kept secret had it have happened. Hmm. I could go more, but I, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But it's quite deep. We, we are actually on Mars. Thank you. Do we want to take one more? Lady behind? Sorry, I just have one question. Um, the chips that they're thinking of sending out, what are the chances of them actually landing without being smashed and being able to send back? I think the idea is that they would be robust and that 50% would survive impact. And if you're sending out several dozens, then you're going to get plenty of data back. We, we can make bunker-busting bombs, which will go through several stories of underground bunkers and count how many floors they're going through before they explode to kill the bad guys. So we can build technology, it's the war dividend, we can build technology that will survive enormous decelerations and still work. So it, it, it can be done, but my understanding of a chipsack concept is that they are sacrificial, some will survive, some won't. Okay, thank you.